So let's go on with this journey. In 2000, the Netherlands legalised by legislation. They opened up uh, marriage to same-sex couples. Belgium followed soon after, uh, Spain soon after, Portugal soon after, uh, Massachusetts and Canada soon after, uh, and uh, several states of the United States. So a, a legislative movement began to appear to open up marriage to same-sex couples uh, on the basis that their relationship was sufficiently analogous and that in a secular society it was wrong and unjust and unequal and discriminatory to deny it to uh, people essentially because of their sexual orientation. In 2003, a case came before the um, Ontario uh, Court of Appeal called Halpern, and that was a case where uh, the application was made uh, for the registration of a marriage. And uh, in that decision, the Court of Appeal of Ontario held that the registrar had been in error in having failed to register it. And that decision in turn led in 2005 to the Canadian Parliament enacting um, the uh, provision for same-sex marriage. Uh, in 2005, in South Africa, in the Minister for Home Affairs and Fury, the Supreme Court of South Africa, uh, the Constitutional Court, held that the South African law, insofar as it wasn't available to same-sex couples, was in breach of the then constitutional provisions in that country uh, which forbade discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. In 2006, a similar decision was made in Israel in a case called Ben Ari before the Supreme Court of Israel where it was held that the registrar of marriages had broken the law by refusing to register such a marriage. The court emphasised that it wasn't deciding the general question, it was deciding what the duty of the registrar was to do to register the marriage. 2009, in the state of Iowa, in the case of Varnum against O'Brien, uh, the judges of the Supreme Court of Iowa held that the state uh, could not violate the equality provisions in its constitution, that there was no rational basis for excluding marriage in the state of Iowa to uh, same-sex couples, and they ordered that that, uh, that status in the law should be, uh, must be available under the Iowa Constitution. Immediately, there was a, um, a call for the dismissal of those judges. The procedure was put in place, as was available under the Constitution of Iowa, uh, to recall the judges who had decided in that way, and the Chief Justice and uh, three other judges of the Supreme Court of Iowa who were up for uh, re-election were recalled and were removed from office. Uh, a shocking instance of the punishment of judges for deciding a matter uh, in uh, accordance with their view of the law and the constitution. 2009, the uh, Court of Cassation of Portugal, in a case called Acordeo Number 359, uh, held that a law passed by the Portuguese Parliament in 2010 was valid. That was probably influenced by the fact that next door in Spain, uh, the eldest daughter of the Pope uh, was, uh, had moved under the Zapatero government to enact uh, the um, uh, same-sex marriage. In 2010, in uh, Russia, a decision went the other way. In the marriage case 33, uh, 1252, the Tver District Court in Moscow held that marriage was not available and they repeated some of the same things of the early decisions that marriage had always been uh, otherwise and therefore shouldn't be available. In 2010, in Italy, the Court of Appeal held that marriage was available to uh, same-sex couples. That was then appealed to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court reversed. Uh, in 2010, in Perry against Schwarzenegger, uh, an application was made to federal court to challenge uh, the so-called Proposition 8, which had been adopted by a narrow majority in the state of um, uh, California in the United States to remove same-sex marriage 
in that state and uh, that was held to be action against a suspect class under the United States Constitution and contrary to the federal constitution of the United States that you could not by a constitutional amendment of a state take away uh, equality rights of citizens of the United States. And that was the decision of the single judge which was recently affirmed two to one uh, in the Court of Appeals of uh, the Federal Circuit in uh, the Ninth Circuit in, uh, uh, in uh, California. The question now for the opposition is whether to take that on appeal to the Banco, that's to have it referred to a Banco Court of um, large numbers of the Federal Circuit Court or to take it straight to the Supreme Court. And in 2010, in a case called Acción to uh, 2010, the Supreme Court of Mexico upheld the right of the Federal District of uh, Mexico to provide same-sex marriage in that district. Uh, there's another case, uh, Alejandro, in 2009 in Argentina, where the Federal Capital uh, judge had held in favour of same-sex marriage. That was before the uh, Constitutional Court of Argentina when the Parliament of Argentina passed same-sex marriage in Argentina. So um, Argentina, Spain, Portugal, the Federal Territory in Mexico, uh, and also countries closer to our legal tradition, such as Canada and New Zealand and states of the United States, uh, have all decided uh, these uh, decisions uh, in uh, the way supporting equality rights and the equal dignity and civic rights of uh, same-sex couples so that if you look at the, the trend of history, how history bends uh, in favour of liberty, uh, it appears to be bending in favour of the validity and availability of uh, these uh, marriages to those who seek them. Now, uh, the question I posed for myself for this talk in honour of Dame Roma Mitchell is what lessons can one learn from the earlier struggles of uh, women for equality and dignity in respect of their rights for the rights of uh, same-sex couples and people who are GLBT, those who are in the sexual minorities. It's interesting if you look at the history of our legal tradition um, and go back to the great reformers of early 19th century, uh, Bentham and Mill, both of them uh, had written at a time when very few wrote about such topics uh, concerning uh, women's equality, uh, the importance of it, uh, and also, uh, in Bentham's case, uh, the removal of the criminal laws against homosexuals. Uh, these were really radical thoughts and ideas uh, in the patriarchy of England at the time, but um, they planted a seed, and the seed uh, bore fruit in the women's movement for uh, voting rights uh, in the United Kingdom, which led to the suffragette movement and the demands for better laws on marriage and divorce for women, uh, which began uh, toward their path towards acceptance in the 19th century. Uh, in 1901, as you know, our constitution contained a provision which protected the right of women to vote in those of the colonies which at Federation had adopted the right of women to vote. New Zealand was the first country in the world to provide for women's equality in voting. Uh, and uh, two states of Australia, South Australia and Western Australia, quickly followed. And the federal constitution said it was up to the, uh, the states in Australia, but they couldn't go backwards. If they had it, uh, women had to have the vote, and it was expected, and it happened, that Australia quickly moved to um, equal rights of women to vote. We were one of the first nations in the world to have equal voting rights for women. They were days when Australia was often in the forefront of social and legal reform. Uh, we were amongst the first countries in the world, Australia and New Zealand, to have uh, the conciliation arbitration system in industrial disputes. 
to have testator family maintenance legislation. Uh, and uh, many other aspects of the law were um, reformatory and unusual. We seem to have lost our path in that respect, and one hopes that we will refine it. Uh, so you have to have uh, action, and you have to have examples. Uh, in 1920, um, there was uh, a move to remove the discrimination against women lawyers. They are amazing cases to read. The cases where women had got uh, equal uh, qualifications to be admitted as lawyers, where the Legal Practitioners Acts said uh, in terms that were neutral in language that a person who has qualifications could be admitted. But somehow these male judges at the time found it possible in their minds to say the women were not persons. An extraordinary uh, decision uh, when we look back on it, but uh, those decisions were overturned by legislation. This legislation in New South Wales was in 1918 after the uh, struggle of Ada Evans to be admitted. In the 1960s, anti-discrimination laws began to proliferate in Australia and a great tribute must be paid here to Don Dunstan in South Australia. He did so many things first, consumer protection laws, um, women's rights, uh, anti-discrimination, uh, the removal of the criminal laws against homosexuals. Uh, it was a very great flowering of reform and in the best way of a federation, it then got copied in other states of the country. But back in the 1960s when these discri anti-discrimination laws were coming, uh, it was a time when uh, there were still criminal laws against homosexuals. And those criminal laws only really passed in England from which they'd come in 1967 and they only really began to be removed in 1972 when the Dunstan government introduced them in South Australia and it took a long time for them to be removed. The last of them being in Tasmania in 1998. Uh, and there's another instance of the cautiousness of my mind. I was telephoned in 1995 when I was president of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales with nothing to do with the Tasmanian legal system uh, by two uh, gay activists, Rodney Croom and Nick Toonan, should we go to Geneva to challenge the uh, Australian laws in Tasmania? I said, no, you shouldn't go to Geneva. There's no way, I said. No way the, you, the, uh, the um, uh, United Nations Committee in Geneva is going to uh, look at that. But uh, the Tunan and against Australia case came before that committee and the United Nations uh, Committee did say that that was contrary to the uh, ICCPR, as uh, the, chair, the President Michael has said. You need theorists who will advance these issues. Uh, like Dennis Altman at La Trobe University, who's been a, a really notable theorist. He was a student politician when I was a student politician. There was no way in those days I would have raised the issues of sexuality, but Dennis was out there thumping the table and making the point, and boy, has he been vindicated. You need political leaders who will support the cause, just as in uh, women's rights and examples of uh, people who are in the category who will stand up and be illustrations of the need for change. You need international law developments like the CEDAW Treaty uh, to uh, give an international uh, impetus to change. You need cultural changes. I always thought that the TV soapy number 96 was a greater influence on this issue of homosexual debate than all the learned uh, lectures I've ever given. It was bringing uh, the realities of life uh, into um, the living rooms of the nation. You need law reform bodies to tackle the needs for legal change. Uh, and you need allies. Um, no legislation on these issues can ever be enacted without the support of heterosexual people. And it's when heterosexual people come to the view 
that these discriminatory provisions are unjust, uh, that is when uh, change begins. And you also need people who are themselves homosexual or members of sexual minorities, bisexual, uh, uh, to stand up and speak for change. Um, I know a number of judges who are homosexual who don't stand up. And in the end of this magnificent book, there is a chapter <laughs> which refers to a, a, a judge. And I don't identify him. I, I never identify people who don't want to be identified. But um, he said to me at the time Jan and I went public, all those nasties will come out of the woodwork and you will pay a price. And it's true that when Senator Heffernan made his speech in the federal parliament, uh, this judge got in touch with me and said, there, I told you so. And so you can, you can understand why people are sometimes cautious. There are nasty people out there. Amazingly, they are often people of religion, which is astonishing. Uh, there is another book which I launched last week. I'm the greatest book launcher in this nation. <laughs> and it's called Five Uneasy Pieces, which is an analysis of, uh, from by theologians of passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament that are supposed to say that God hates gays. Well, it's a very, intuitively, it's a rather unlikely thing. But it's so interesting to read it because it shows how similar the debates about interpretation are in theology to the debates we have in the law. The narrow formalists and literalists and those who will take a purposive and broader interpretation. So there it is. It's a very interesting question. There are a lot of wonderful cases in this book published by the, uh, the um, uh, International Commission of Jurists. Uh, there are marvellous reflections on it in this book. <laughs> Uh, there are wonderful uh, biblical insights uh, in this book, uh, and if you wanted to, you could spend your whole life studying this question, but you won't. Uh, however, it is a question that citizens should reflect upon, and they can do so if they are lawyers with the knowledge that history bends to justice and to equality and to equal dignity, and that is what the cases and the courts are doing, and I believe we will see change in this country and I hope it won't be too long delayed. Okay, we can have a big round of applause and then some quick Q&A.